critics of progress as in the critics of development and critical reflection on the whole idea of modernity, right? Um, so if you have more questions on ecological economics, probably you could also have them in the discussion. So let's move into ecological economics. Just like very briefly, um, what is the difference between a neoclassical economics that I imagine that many of you are studying here and ecological economics? First, that in neoclassical economics you have strong comparability of values, right? You can compare the margin, the utility of person A with utility of person B, or you could actually compare according to numbers. Um, in ecological economics, you can't really compare values so much. Oh, in a sense, what this tree means for me is not this tree, is not what this tree or this mountain means to someone else. So this makes the whole quantification expression of value very complicated, especially when it comes to kind of destroying certain type of landscape for, for, for gold mining, for example. The whole idea of comparing values comes very much into question. So this means that you just can't really open a mine without really taking into consideration how the way local communities value certain type of site. Then you have what we call commensurability and incommensurability. In, in neoclassical economics, you kind of assume more or less perfect measurability of, of various type of phenomena. While ecological economics, you can't we figure out that we can't really measure everything. For example, probably nature or let's say human life doesn't have a price. That's why in like environmental economics you have the value of time, the value of life, etc. So it's kind of these type of values also kind of ethically questioned in certain type of scenarios. Then in ecological economics we have non-criteria evaluation. We mean we value everything according to monetary kind of calculations. While in ecological economics we use multi-criteria evaluation. Have you heard about multi-criteria evaluation? So it's kind of it's a, it's a measure of it's a way of economic measurement, which is kind of very complex, where you measure things in terms of money, but also in terms of kilo, in terms of water, in terms of in terms of water, in terms of um, let's say energy, kilojoules. It's just like you just use multiple metrics to measure certain type of things. And multi-criteria evaluation as well. We use also kind of different type of decision making processes in terms of we, we're not doing only weighting and averages, but we also try to have participative processes evaluated, to kind of have a mixture of participants, a mixture of actors that could all contribute to the way value is being measured and created. So we have the issue of participation more integrated. I'm going to put it on the next slide. And finally, while well, neoclassical economics is very much on the weak sustainability side, what does it mean? That actually assumes perfect replaceability, right? That kind of nature and natural resources act actually, like in the, in the most standard neoclassical economic form, nature could be completely replaced by technology, right? While uh, ecological economics is based on the idea of strong sustainability, namely that you can't really replace kind of many of the material inputs that we put in the economy, right? That you just they can't be replaced by technology and they can't be replaced by capital. They can't be, to an extent, they can't be replaced with other materials, but not by capital, right? So this is an assumption that makes the whole way of calculating very different. But also kind of other, certain, something else um, about ecological economics. Let's say our school our, of ecological economics, which is very much represented by, by economists like Jean-Martin Salier and Klaus Pasch, are very much kind of critical of marginal analysis, as I postulated, which I call mathematical formality of economics, and which is kind of very much based on assumptions that are questionable, right? And um, so then, so when you don't use the Unitarian theory, a whole way of calculating this kind of and learning economic analysis is changing. It means that you actually have to develop other ways of calculating value and making kind of economic analysis. So two key ideas that I wanted to, to to flesh out today. One is the importance of thinking about social metabolism, right? Rather than just like. Uh, let's say the Douglas equation with capital and labor and, and kind of technology. Let's say we can think of social metabolism and then uh, a social metabolism, we can think of the economy or let's say of a city or just a country as a body. 
where all materials come in and the same quantity of materials come out. So everything that comes in the, in the economy goes out in the same quantity, in equal amount, but in, in quantity to different type, type of shape. Let's say in, we, we call it, and here we use a lot of the work by the um, Romanian brilliant economist Rogescu Robin, who who talks about the kind of the level of entropy, the, the, the kind of the, um, the role of entropy, of the fact that energy is always going from from kind of low level of entropy to high level of entropy, or of water, for example, goes from hot to to cold, and there's no way to 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 capture the energy that has been lost in this process of cooling down. So, and and this is the first law of entropy. The second law is like that, that this process is irreversible. So, like in that sense, pollution is always, in a physical sense, an inevitable result of everything that happens to the economy. So, in, in that sense, ecological economy doesn't reject the idea of externalities as something that could be fixed by putting the prices right. On the contrary, they think that the externalities are just like inevitable process of cost shifting. Their way of capturing the value of nature and using it, in a sense, that always create, generate some sort of waste and pollution that can't be just fixed by prices. So, also kind of, in there it's also interesting to think of the finite stocks and the fact that the kind of the petrol and the minerals are out there and they're kind of limited and, and not only that but they're actually getting deeper and deeper and deeper in the ground and they kind of actually require more energy to be extracted and they kind of require more type of let's say interventions to be to get to there because very often rare minerals are, are found and very kind of far distant places of the planet where, where, where local communities are living and, and somehow extracting them implies a lot of level of violence which needs to be that kind of taken into consideration. So social metabolism, there is a lot of social metabolism studies, you could look at the literature, there is a lot of social metabolism for example in Barcelona to see how much water comes in and water comes out, the social metabolism of waste. <laughs> Of, of material flows, etc. It's kind of a very interesting study. If, if some of you is interested in doing social metabolism of a city, of a country, of a, let's say a farm or a, something like that, you could come ask to us and we could, we could show you how it's done and we could do something like that. For example, we're doing something about we're trying to do something with the social metabolism of tourism in Barcelona, really to figure out what's the real impact of tourism, not only in terms of income, but also in terms of waste, flows, water, kind of. Air pollution as well is also part of the social metabolism study. There is kind of institutes that are doing the social metabolism study for the brain for the entire Catalonia, which is very interesting also to kind of look at. But another interesting point about like key point in ecological economics is the role of decision making or how do we do evaluation of actually needs to be informed by different actors, not only by the business, not only by the government, but also needs to be informed by the different stakeholders involved in the process. So, kind of, um, this somehow puts a limit on the financial valuation, because like economics, we have standard criteria, for example, if you do cost-benefit analysis, you just like calculate the market values, see how much it costs, how much, how much a certain type of project would cost, how it would try to quantify the damages. So that's pretty straightforward, but let's say, if we say that you cannot value nature with money, or if you cannot value lives or livelihoods with money, or if you cannot value the spiritual level of the mountain with, ma with money, what do you do? Then it's kind of you need different process of decision making uh, for, in order to start a project that would have certain economic value. So in that sense you need some sort of um, participatory processes to decide upon upon kind of valuing and for in terms of kind of going for certain type of economic decision. And and this is also kind of informed by the limits to market based instruments like as a kind of way to 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 measure certain type of projects. Because well there is a lot of debate also in ecological economics. Shall we value with money or shall we not value? There is those who say, well, we could value, for example, environmental damage that done, for example, in the in Ecuador, the oil spill of Texaco, Texaco has been one of the positive examples where kind of the negative impact of, of valuing the oil, the, the oil spill has been kind of, I don't know, kind of accounted to seven million dollars 
and local communities could actually start with the court case and they could manage to win this court case and they actually demanded this type of kind of this type of damage to be repaid by tax taxable. So there are certain kind of cases when reclaiming damage in monetary terms could to some extent be positive, especially for local communities. But there are other cases when when value in nature, for example, in ecosystem services could drive away for communication, right? And when that happens, let's say, that could put the peril a lot of the local communities who cannot enter the game so easily and who cannot be compensated for all the financial um, compensations that, that it would receive. And there is something interesting also, kind of another point that very much crosses lines in ecological economics, which is the idea of post-normal science. Have you heard about post-normal science? And so it's kind of it's important to consider when during decision making uh, because like post-normal science is is mostly used in situations of let's say climate change, situations of complexity and multiple scales and the need for and causes the need for reflexivity. And it's kind of it's used when facts are uncertain, for example, climate change. Like there's high level, there is different type of scenarios, but it's impossible to have certainty in terms of how much temperature degrees or what type of climate kind of extreme events we're going to have. When values are understood, what certain type of economic community values a certain type of money, a local community probably doesn't value in terms of money. Or, sir, or you mean that kind of values actually cannot, cannot be equalized, and there is a lot of discussion about how we value. But those kind of stakes are high when we talk about future generations, when we talk about local communities, when we talk about entire islands being lost, etc. And when decisions are urgent, right? So when we have to kind of take a decision very quickly, kind of um, neoclassical economy does not provide us a tool that we can really count upon for taking very taking a well-informed uh, decision about how we can go ahead. Yeah. And um, this is where I plan to jump to Jigro, but I wonder if there could be some questions at this point. Yeah? Yeah? I don't understand how to do this. Well, so basically the whole idea of post-normal post 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 science is an idea that when situations of uncertainty and high complex and complexity and when you have to really urgently take a decision what to do with climate change, the whole idea is that we need to pass for, pro for a more reflexive process. We need to pass for a process where we just like try to put more stakeholders on board. We need, we need to put more stakeholders, stakeholders on board and we need to kind of be using the precautionary principle much more strongly. This is something indeed that I should have said that. So the idea is that we need to kind of rest on the minimum damage that we could cause when when we don't know with certainty the facts and we don't know when stakes are very high, when we know that actually the impact of our actions and our decisions is going to be very high and it's going to impact seriously and severely future generations but also kind of indigenous people but also kind of everyone. So it's actually yeah, it's called for using the precarious principle and and the use of participatory tools for evaluation and decision making. Yeah. So from here on, I think I would like to start talking about the growth. Let's ask, please. Yes. Yeah. Of course, of course. When we talk about decision making, I have a slide about that. It was like, for example, one of the basic fundamentals of growth is actually direct democracy. So we talk about decision making, we talk about deepening democracy, including all types of stakeholders, and recognizing. Ecological debt, the ecological debt which the North owns to the South, but also the embodied debt, the, the, the debt which is uh, owned to all the women for doing all the productive work and creating all the bodies that are necessary for the capitalism to function. 
So actually when we talk about decision making, we need to consider safe spaces in which different types of communities could participate. I'm not talking only about decision making at the municipal stick, so we're talking about decision making at the neighborhood, at the barrio, but also kind of but not only through the known ways of kind of participating, but also kind of in different types of forms where where stakeholders which feel more vulnerable could actually have the right to participate. Which is kind of very complicated and it's kind of very, very kind of probably this is where we actually this is the biggest struggle, the most complex thing. How do we take the multiple voices into account? But we'll talk about that. Because um, let's say if we could imagine ecological economics as a kind of one ball, the growth is another ball and they cross they have a crossover in the begin in the middle, let's say ecological economics and it's biophysical and critics of marginal utility and, and economics is one of the foundations of degrowth. And degrowth economics is an ample field and I'm going to move on to there. Um, but this is sort of overlap. So when we talk about degrowth, it's very, it's kind of, we need to pass through a process of understanding why we need to talk about degrowth and what's the problem with growth. Because degrowth before all is a kind of a critic to growth and a critic to the obsession with growth. So it's kind of two separate kinds of A critic to the, to the cult towards growth, a critic to the idea of growth by all means, growth as a kind of ultimate goal of society. So, so what's, what's actually, what's wrong with growth? Let's start with a very pure econ economic way of thinking about growth. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard about the work of Herman Daly, perhaps? Well, he's kind of one of the founders of ecological economics. And in the, let's say, 80s, 90s, in the early 90s, he created the so-called genuine progress indicator, in which it's a kind of alternative measure to GDP, in which he actually took into account and monetized, let's say, environmental damage associated with production and consumption, and also all the reproductive work, unpaid reproductive work that entered into the, into the economy. And what he found is that over time, let's say, the genuine progress indicator has been growing until the end of the 80s, but afterwards, actually, growth has been uneconomic, the way his terminology is uneconomic, which means like the costs in terms of uh, livelihoods, in terms of um, ecological damage, in terms of vulnerability, are higher than the benefits in terms of what we gain, in terms of consumption, and etc. So you can see, um, this is still using marginal theory. He's kind of still one of the ecological economists that actually still kind of uses marginal theory. But you can see that up to here, you see how marginal benefits equal marginal costs. And up to here, you can see that marginal benefits stop growing, and from here, marginal benefits start decreasing. So actually, many of the economists, for all the economists, the biggest economists are somewhere here. So, so economic is actually um, uh, economic growth is uneconomic. But there is also something else that's going on, and you can see that actually mm, mature economy has stopped growing, um, including famous financial managers of the United States, of the United States, States have found, have declared in kind of very mainstream newspapers that you could forget about projections of high growth, 3% in the United States. Actually, in the future, we should look kind of the best projection that could have is about 1%, 0.9. So actually, so pushing for this growth is actually not, not going to provide some sort of um, positive outcomes in the future. So this is, then apart from that point, let's, let's look at other important argument that's actually given for growth. That they can actually, if you read World Bank or most of the kind of, let's say, projections, one of the, one of the reasons to go for growth is that growth is actually lifting up out of poverty, right? The trickle down effect, about which I, I, I could imagine can read a lot. Actually, if you look at the real data, if you put the, all the income growth in, on the world level, on, a, on a, together, and somehow separate for percentile, you could see that the income growth from the, this is, I think he did it again between the, between the eight, between 80s and 2013. 
So he actually found that the, those who were at the lowest, at the percentile, I think 70, 80 percentile, didn't have actually much income growth. All the income growth actually that, that the world economies experienced actually has been accumulating here in the 19 percentile. Actually, most of it has gone to the 1 percent. And um, there's a lot of work done by Jason Hickel, especially you can see you can consult his. His book called The Divide, and he's been looking at that also. This is world level, but he has graphs like that for, for China, for Africa, for, for the United States, for Europe, for Latin America. So you can see something like that is happening everywhere. So actually, we can't really, although the absolute number, of the absolute income per capita has grown, let's say, by two dollars, let's say, relative income, and lifting real, which is not sufficient to lift people out of poverty. So actually, poverty has not really increased in the process of economic growth. In the, points of, in the moments of history of highest economic growth. Then, another field that is kind of, this, this is where I originally come from. I've done my PhD on the economics of capitalism and climate change. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Easterling paradox? Easterling paradox? Okay. So, so like a number of economists, I, I would say classical economy started measuring the relationship between economic growth and happiness over time, let's say after the 40s, 50s in the United States. So uh, Eastern Link is originally American and he started like looking at happiness data after the Second World War. And what he found is that while at a certain point of time, the richest, although there is a lot of variation, but it seems that the richest nature, nations have high level of happiness in comparison to the poorest nations, but still there is a lot of Still, if you look at country by country, from the from 55, well, average income is growing exponentially. Average income, quality of education, quality of housing, comfort, let's say salaries, etc., are simply growing up. The percentage of people that that kind of um, the, the level of happiness over time does not change. Actually, increases a little bit after the 40s, but doesn't happen. But so actually, accumulation doesn't contribute to happiness. And so then, why do we do it all? No, in a sense, like, what's the point of growth? And interesting, you might say that this data that mostly comes from the United States. You can find graphs like that for the UK, for Germany, for Europe, etc. But lately, something like that is happening in China. So you could look at this graph as well. So in 99, um, for a capital income was about 2,000 in per year, right? For in China, and happiness was 4.7 in China. Let's say in 2010 the happiness, um, the income has doubled, more than doubled, right? To 7,000 something, and happiness is the same. So what's happening? Um, why the China is kind of the is monster economy, which is boosting the development and kind of economic growth? And at the same time, kind of contributed a lot to the world development and exports. What's going on with China? And why is it like they call it the China Depression? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I just wonder how is happiness. Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, like happiness is measured on a, as a kind of response to a question which has a scale from 0 to 10. And the question is the following. Taking everything in your life into consideration, how satisfied with your life do you feel on a scale from 1 to 10? Whereas, whereas 0 is kind of completely unhappy and 10 is completely happy. Well, certainly saying that, I know that every one of us has their own way of perceiving happiness and it's kind of, there's a lot of variation, so there's a big error factor there. But you could see that when you look at these statistics, it seems that there is no correlation between results, responses on happiness and and physical health, uh, what other people say about you, how they perceive you, and other type of characteristics. So it's kind of a measure that has a lot of has certain type of error term, but its tendency seems to be kind of stable. So it's kind of something that we could use for analysis. So for example, I did the happiness in Barcelona, and I just I did a study on happiness in Barcelona during the crisis to see what's the relation between loss of income and happiness. And one of the findings that I found is that, what findings that I arrived at is that using a representative sample of 800 people in Barcelona was that 
the people during the crisis who still had lost money, lost income, but would have a little bit more free time and would have the um, possibility to engage with activities that they consider meaningful, which means like participation in kind of 50 and mobilization around society within Ignatius movement, or urban gardens, or parent cooperatives, or moving out of town to start their own initiative. So there's a kind of very fertile field for starting kind of new initiatives on the community levels of people who engage who could engage in sharing activities were actually happier, although they had an income loss. I'm not talking about the people who entered in unemployment because unemployment is certainly negative, contributing negatively to happiness. But I'm talking to the people who still had kind of income buffer and who still kind of had something to kind of could still kind of cover their incomes. So actually, happiness theory is saying that happiness tends to increase with income only until the point that we mean that we meet our basic needs. Certainly, basic needs can be kind of could vary. Now it's a different way. Of but still, like, it seems that once a country passes a threshold of, let's say, 10,000 or between 10 and 15,000 GDP per capita, um, happiness doesn't increase any longer. Kind of, the, more, the more we consume, doesn't really kind of have any kind of happiness because we adapt and because we continuously compare ourselves with the others. What we consider is necessary is a function of what, we, of what the others actually are consuming. So that's about happiness and growth. Let's move on. And uh, let's talk a little bit about um, climate change and, and biophysical limits to growth, etc. So a lot of um, neoclassical economics and the whole idea of substitutability between materials and, and capital, it are kind of assumes that there could be a lot of that, that probably we could decouple economic growth from environmental impact. Meaning, you can continue growing, you can continue accumulating, you can continue consuming, and probably we could sleep, we could kind of be more efficient, and we could probably um, adopt greener technology, which are not so polluting. Yet, if you look at the historical tendency, what we find is that so far, one percentage of growth is associated between 0 0.6, 0 0.8, increase in greenhouse gases. So we could find pretty straightforward toward kind of positive correlation between habit, uh, with, uh, between uh, income growth and greenhouse gas emissions. So actually climate change and growth are actually pretty much tied in. Then we could look at the increase of raw materials. There is a number of studies of, of ecological economists that so, do social metabolism, what I just talked earlier. And you could see more studies that show that there is almost very high correlation between income between growth, GDP, and the increase of raw materials extraction. Extraction of fossil fuels, extraction of, of, me of metals, extraction of gold, of silver, of lithium, and etc., which is actually accelerating a lot. The same with water footprint. So, and let's see what I have a graph here. So you could see, there is kind of very consistent studies that show that economic growth is very is almost one to one related with environmental health, with climate change, with biodiversity loss, with water salination, etc. So that's this is why actually the critics of, of growth comes very strongly and started already more or less from, from the idea that they are biophysical limits to growth. Because the economy is still very material, much more material than we could imagine. And I'm going to come back to that. And here there is kind of from a biodiversity perspective. This is a kind of another study that's, that's looking at the relation between GDP growth and biodiversity extinction. You can see um, how the number of threatened and endangered species is actually moving almost the same way as uh, world economic growth. It makes sense, no? How, what, what does growth mean? Actually, you know, more factories, more extraction, more roads. More, more supermarkets, which are actually built in places of more urban sprawl, and so more mines, and of course, biodiversity is kind of having its big. Um, so, so the point of, of, on the impacts of growth can carry on and can carry on and can carry on, and you could see in this study there is not so much discussion on the relation between economic growth and, and the multiple environmental or social impacts. But actually, the question is, how do you read this data, right? How do you interpret this data? Um, from a 
neoclassical or let's say environmental economics, which is the branch of economics which is still using the neoclassical economics tools for the work on the environment. You can see that probably we could go for more more efficient or so-called green economy, plant more trees, use ecological bulbs, let's say use more car, like electric cars and etc. So that's one of the responses for the so-called green growth. And before moving to the green growth, I would say like let's let's look at the green growth and up to what extent green growth could be a solution. By the way, are there questions about what I was just saying? Because I go a bit fast. If someone has a reflection question or clarification. So let me talk about green growth, the idea that we could carry on growing while consuming the same level of, uh, let's say, goods that we produce. So the point that the economic growth that we've been experiencing so far has been correlating a lot with the extraction of fossil fuels. And the fossil fuels that we're consuming so far have pretty high level of something we call ROE. Have you heard about energy return on energy investment? So energy return on energy investment is how much energy you get out of the same energy uh, invested. So for example, how many barrels of petrol do you get for, for one barrel of petrol invested in extraction? In the beginning, let's say in the 40s, 40s, the energy return of energy investment, let's say, of, of um, oil has been, let's say, almost 100, which means for one kind of for one liter of oil that you get, you get 100. Right, because petrol has been very high at the surface. Now the levels, of the, the returns of, uh, of oil are actually have been dwindling a lot, and actually because oil is actually getting further and further and further deeper in the ground, and actually it's it's found more in more kind of far away places, so you have to use a lot of uh, oil to transport it. So now actually the return of on oil and fossil fuels is that almost according to let's say the last statistics between 2025 20, depending where it's actually and the coal is actually pretty kind of yeah about 20 and if you look at the energy return on energy investment of renewables still they're not catching up so far for example photovoltaics have one to six have, have a return of six windmills have a bit higher let's say one to 15 or 18 but their life cycle is short, let's say about 30, 30 years. I'm saying this because if you see that, that if the energy return, energy investment, all mainstream fossil fuels, which have been the driver of the economic growth over the last decades, is actually falling while renewables are not having so high return, so then an economy which is based only on renewables might not be growing. Or might not might be growing so much, especially because of the um, because of the material requirements in terms of mining, in terms of transportation, but also because of the shorter life cycle. And here we also kind of need to consider the energy return of, of nuclear power plants, which is also kind of pretty pretty questionable. There is a lot of discussion like that in the data. So just to sum up, the kind of a growing economy, which is based which is kind of which is based on renewable energy is kind of very very difficult to achieve. So then I'm coming back to the whole idea of green growth and the material base of the economy. And here I have some notes. Um, yeah. So you could look at this graph. So uh, this kind of the graph on the right is, is showing, for example, this is GDP, and this is the the use of material, the material extraction, and when we talk about material extraction, it's again all metal, ores, including sand, stone, everything that we need here is based on extraction. And so very often we are just like, when we talk about extraction, it's hard to live it, it's hard to imagine because we live far away from the mines, but everything that is around us, the stones, the walls, it's all based on extraction. All new buildings in Barcelona are based on extraction. All new have the main impacts of people somewhere far away in India and Latin America who are living and, and, and kind of purged from their kind of communities. And this is something that we're far away and somehow read in the, in, the, in the newspapers, but we don't live it. So it's actually, when you talk about material extraction, it's not just dry statistics, it's lies. 
And it's something that we need to kind of know and do and, and live and kind of see how we resonate with that. So the material based of the economy. If you look at the, um, at the way material growth has been happening over the last years, the, until the 2000s, material growth, the interior extraction was falling more or less GDP. It was growing with the level of GDP, of gross domestic product. But from 2000 on, um, material extraction started growing at 3.5, which is actually higher than, than GDP. What actually is happening is that the world economy is getting more material intense, rather less material intense. So actually, the idea of greening the economy, making it less material, is actually a complete chimera, complete illusion. There's numbers of studies, like, yeah, it's around one by, you could look at paper by Kittel and Harris, you could look at Steinberger. There's number of studies that show how, kind of, yeah, also kind of, uh, let's see, I could quote other names here as well, if I managed to figure out where I put it right down. But anyway, you could find a lot of data showing that. The, the economy is getting more materially intense rather than less materially intense. So talking about green growth is just like completely out of question. It's kind of completely impossible to achieve this point. And oh, oh wow, if you talk about like economy with now, for example, developed economy, it's all based on services. For example, most of the activities here are based on Let's say most of the economic activities in Catalonia, let's say 70% of it is based on services like teaching, accounting, etc. So you could say that these are not so energy intensive, but actually, if you look at the level of consumption and all the imported goods, you could see that that material uh, consumption is actually grow, growing. And another argument about the, the feasibility of green growth is that if we move to green growth, let's say, we can't really say that the profits made in the green sector are going to be. Expand, expanded only in the green sector. They could be kind of, they are always going to be expanded also in the other sectors. So actually the way green growth looks like, it's, I really like this quote by my colleague Francois Schneider, who says that green economy is like green icing on a toxic cake, right? You could imagine how all toxic sectors are keeping the thing the same, while the grew up so far, for example, nuclear and fossil fuels and mining, the kind of, the thing the same and are growing. And there is some small fraction of the green economy which stays on top, just to kind of, just to kind of, uh, just to kind of little cover toward of a cave. So it's actually very much a kind of, uh, kind of illusionary process that green growth could happen. And and the third reason why we need to talk about, um, well, green growth is not considered feasible in the growth is because of the so-called rebound effect and Jevons paradox. Familiar? Um, so actually, it's that kind of the, another brilliant economist that it, it's a pity that is not studied in universities, and I don't know why that's not happening. Is is Jevons, who started studying um, kind of the industrial revolution just when the steam engine got discovered, and at some point he just he found when the steam engines were getting more efficient, he figured out that. He expected that when the steam engine is getting more efficient from certain, for example, from one kilo of carbon, before you would get just like 10 kilojoules of electricity. And, and with efficient, more efficient R kind of machines, from one kilo of carbon, you could get, let's say, 100 kilojoules. And he was said, probably at some point we're going to reach a moment when, when we're going to stay idle, we're going to have more free time, we're going to go, we not have to extract so much because we produce much more, right? We get more efficient. But actually, what happened is just for a couple of years, extraction doubled. So actually, it means that so far, uh, all the efficiency gains that are produced in the production are actually taken away by the, by actually a loss or cancelled by the increase of production, right? So actually, productivity grows, but together with it, demand grows. And you could see it here, actually, you could see it here in the, kind of, in, the, in the classical demand curve. What happens is that with, with the decrease of costs associated more with more efficient production, cost falls. And when cost falls, demand also increases. So actually, what happens with, with cars? When cars get more efficient, people start to drive faster, and uh, people start to drive longer distances. 
or when you have when you put energy efficient bulbs in the house with a, with the savings and your money you actually could buy more goods from China or let's, uh, there is multiple examples for example machines that could extract more efficiently actually go deeper in the in the forest or deeper in the ground so actually all so far all technical innovations have served humanity to go deeper to expand more and to gain more profits actually out of that so this rebound effect, this paradox, which always makes us squirrels more, is cancelling out a lot of the energy gains that we are kind of trying to have uh, with, the, with the energy. This is not to say that we don't need energy efficiency, right? This is to say that probably in a degrowth scenario, we need to kind of think of energy efficiency plus reduction of consumption. And this is where I'm telling you. Yeah, please. I can't understand why it's a uh, paradox. Since uh, the capitalism works this way, right? And you can get more, you just get more. You should need to get. If you keep thinking in like capitalist terms, it's just. I don't understand what the paradox is. Yeah. What's the capitalism paradox? <laughs> It's a good point. Probably we, we shouldn't. We should call. We should. We should make a paper and tell them they should not. They should not call it jealous paradox. <laughs> I agree. I mean, it should not be a paradox. I agree. Like that. Actually, the more like, efficient you could get, you should use this efficiency to exploit more. I agree. Probably it should not be called a paradox. Yeah. That's a bad idea. <laughs> um, okay. So the so yeah, the story about the feasibility of green growth will carry on and on and on. So it's kind of the key. So the, the key kind of conclusion or logical point you want to get from here is like, what does this information imply? Um, and from the degrowth growth community, we are we, we start to kind of find more evidence that actually the only way to actually face, um, let's say, the extinction. That we are facing, or like the increasing uh, in global inequality, is by decree, by drastic decreasing of throughput, or and we're thinking also mindset, we're thinking kind of imaginary, we're thinking models, and kind of also ways of government. And here we go into kind of what, what, and this leads us to the idea of degrowth. Well, it's important to say that probably a bit about the history of degrowth would be interesting to say a few words about that. The growth started as kind of originally in the writings of the Club of Rome, um, the limits to growth, with a report they issued in the 70s, where they just put the finance stocks into the into of, of the planet into one kind of model and started looking how what happens with these stocks when you keep on consuming the same. And they figure out at some point, let's say about 2020 and or 2030, there's going to be a kind of climate crisis and other type of crises and this is more or less, we're more or less following their trajectories. But then, uh, but then activists from, let's say, more, let's say, from anti-car movements in France, but also kind of other type of movements, took up this slogan, degrowth, and started campaigning around it. And then, uh, for reduction of the number of cars, and etc. But then the interesting thing is that, like, this activist, this is why we call degrowth an activist science, because these calls from activists were taken on by researchers and they started organizing and they started organizing conferences around it because it kind of it's a very fertile field for doing research. And because it gives right gives kind of rise to very interesting questions to, to, to ponder upon. So this is how in like mm, a number of conferences can be started, let's say in two thousand and eight in Paris, then in two thousand and ten we organized Wagner Barcelona. <coughs> And conferences on degrowth are now kind of surging every two years, and there's more and more and more researchers and activists. So this is a field where um, the research goes together very much tightly linked to the material reality of the planet and to the reality of those impacted by economic expansion, either with their bodies or with their livelihoods. And there is a kind of a concept. So this is why degrowth is like a field of research that's kind of still evolving, right? It's still kind of it, it's a field of research where we just keep on being reflecting upon our, our work and constantly updating our knowledge. So you could see some different ways of defining the growth. Let's say from a, from activist science perspective, the growth is a call for abandoning the cold privilege to economic growth. Right? The kind of the idea of putting growth is not the overarching goal of society. Then, from a political ecology perspective, the growth is a call for radical politicizing, radical political and economic reorganization of society. 
which is associated with drastic reduction of the fruitful of social metabolisms. More from an ecological perspective, the growth we defined it some years ago as a kind of democratically led inequitable downsizing of the body of the kind of, let's say, metabolism of the planet, especially in the global north, which improves human livelihood, let's say happiness, and also kind of contributes to kind of environmental sustainability while also taking into consideration justice. And the definitions carry on. The growth is also kind of, let's say, it very often uses a slogan that mobilizes various movements, let's say, now Climaxion, for example, in Barcelona, but also kind of uh, other, let's say, anti-mining movements, the, the, the anti-coal movements also, the anti the kind of, let's say, the movement for decreasing tourism in Barcelona, let's say, using also the cushion as a kind of slogan. So, and the growth is also kind of, can be thought of a network of ideas that give, that give some sort of um, patterns or suggestions for how we can change everyday, everyday living, let's say, and on a more personal and community type of, uh, community type of organization. So, and Latouche, one of the founders, is calling the society of frugal abundance. Because actually, the growth, according to many, is also called for abundance, because the way we define our needs is like our, the idea of abundance is a function of our needs. So if we rethink our needs, our kind of what we consider necessary is going to be completely changing. So, and a few kind of clarification about what the growth is, no, is not, which is useful to pass with in order to kind of to, to avoid um, kind of confusion. So the growth is not only reducing alone, because actually if we reduce GDP, keeping all the rest and kind of the same, that would be a crisis. So the growth is not a crisis and is not a recession. The growth implies changing the type of institutions and the type of economic organization and the type of relationships that we have. Let's say day labor relationships as well and, and kind of, so rethinking many parameters. So it's not about pushing the economy immediately into a crisis. No, the idea is like, the growth is like, not only less, but different, yeah? Um, that I've already said about the so it's kind of the growth is also kind of we don't perceive it as a top-down policy. We rather perceive it as a kind of a mixture of. It's not it's not very clear how what's the exact political strategy to achieve the growth. The idea is to have a mixture of approaches. Let's say bottom-up, community-driven, together with municipality-oriented action, and let's see what else. And as much as and we see as how far the growth could reach actually also parliaments and decision making, which is kind of very difficult because there, it's there where the religion of growth is actually having its deepest roots. So the growth is kind of a, something that's not, not top down, you know, we're not talking about green fashion, right? Um, also, let's say we have been having this debate with more, let's, let's say from economists that, or others that the growth is the opposite of growth. It, Although the word might be misleading, the growth doesn't mean negative growth. It means kind of actually qualitative changes in the type of confronting the growth is imperative, which is like the new imaginaries and new type of spaces and new debates that are actually being offered. Nor is it Malthusia in terms of like thinking of how to shrink the human population. On the contrary, the growth approach, like the growth movement advocates the idea of conscious corporations to stop capitalism from exploiting female bodies to produce more kind of um, more soldiers and cheap labor. So this is what actually the question is whether there was something getting. Also, we try not degrowth. We try not to be too catastrophist, saying that we need to degrow because otherwise we're gonna die, right? So not to be kind of we don't want to degrow because of fear. We want to we want to have a society that degrow based on the idea that we could change as much as we can, but we could change and we want to do it collectively and through deliberative action, right? Not, not forced, uh, not, not by force. So, um, what do we consider when talking about the growth? We talk about like philosophical sources or roots, we talk about um, sectors, we could talk about the growth in different sectors, we could talk about different strategies, because like the 
there's multiple strategies in terms of like calling the actors involved, or you could have also kind of multiplicity, a need to have multiplicity of actors. So I'm quickly gonna go for the sectors, uh, for the subsectors, for the so-called philosophical roots of sources of the problem. And this this range from let's say from anthropological studies, let's say from social studies and the work of Latouche and Arturo Escobar, is there let's say the critics of development. Then we can move on, move on to psychological economics, the, the studies of the bank is falling to grow. Then studies on psychology and social psychology, which are related to social comparison of happiness. This is also another stream that actually feeds into the degrowth uh, term. We talk about kind of direct democracy in the work of Pastorialis, Ivan Pivic is kind of another source of inspiration for degrowth. Then studies on environmental justice and kind of the so-called environmentalism of the poor, another kind of key, kind of key, key type of fault and, and school that feeds into the growth. And, and also the kind of studies, studies on social justice, the need to redistribute kind of wealth and ecofeminism are another key kind of source or root of the growth. And I'm gonna go through all of these. Let's say I still have time. Because I have a feeling that I'm talking a lot. I have some other questions because I imagine it's tiring all the time. Yeah, please. Actually, before that, yeah. I think you showed this graph of the GDP growth in the last year that our actually getting more and more intense, more material intense on a global scale. But I was wondering how is it that country level or let's say developed countries and how is GDP getting that level? Yeah. This is actually this is, a, this is a great debate because actually economists in developed countries are claiming that uh, we, are, we are reaching relative decoupling. Or we mean that in developed countries we have um, the growth is actually faster than the material extraction. Material extraction is much slower. But actually, this type of studies don't take into account on how imported goods. So everything that is shifted out. If you take into account the whole, if you take total material account of all the imported goods, material extraction is actually growing. So it depends on the type of metrics that you use. Yeah. Some other kind of questions, doubts, reflections. And just a moment of silence and stretching, you know? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. I have to think about this. The statement that you made that maybe an economy based on, on renewable energies is not growing in the sense that uh, maybe it's true that in order to grow it has not to be renewable in the sense that there is a kind of uh, waste uh, degradation or some something that hides somehow society or the environment that makes the economy grow so Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. trying to refer to the previous classes yeah. as well. Yeah. The kind of surplus that is in yeah. society could be also thought about environment. There's yeah. a surplus that is taken by capital or economic growth and so on that is needed in order to let the machine yeah. work because if it is all recyclable, there is no surplus and then the machine doesn't exactly. move. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Actually, if we move to 100 percent there is a lot of huge field now on how do we move to 100 percent renewable. And there's lots of different scenarios and different assumptions because it's actually it's all about how we imagine that. And it's all based on trends of the past, so we can't make this model. But indeed, actually, most of the models that are based on 100% renewable, for example, IPCC made a model for um, a kind of for, for facing climate change. For, and, and actually, they say that their model that's actually the only model that's efficient in terms of facing climate change and, uh, and slowing down. The increase in temperature is associated with 40% reduction of uh, energy consumption and renewables. And that would be a society of no growth. Of no, no growth. No growth. So actually, so the growth is, we don't see the growth as a goal in itself, by the way. We just like, there are some graphs that imagine that the growth, to use this marker, no? So for example, now we have been growing. So now the growth is probably, we imagine that the growth would be something like that. For a period, and afterwards, until we reach some sort of, let's say, ecological and social sustainability. And afterwards, and afterwards, probably it's going to go up like this, up, up and down. So, so that will be kind of daily refers to this as a steady state economy. 
in which you reach some sort of sustainability level in which everything that's extracted is actually regenerated afterwards. So we just try to turn the loop. Although, according to just put open and the, the second law of the thermodynamics, entropy is always um, is always increasing. So there is limits to the recyclability of materials. For example, you can't recycle something endlessly. Uh, so at some point, materials are going to be extracted, so we have to see them. And there are limits also to efficiency and to recyclability. But yeah, indeed, so for example, let's say the IPCC are more heading towards this critique, the degrowth, 40% degrowth plus afterwards we will end the lower level of material consumption. And indeed, actually, there have been some models which say that if we go back to the consumption that we have in the 70s, when happiness rates would have been a bit higher, we could live somehow in a planet which is more equitable and we could have a little bit of more ecological balance. We could have a kind of better environmental parameters. And then, let's say nature would have the space to regenerate itself. Yeah. Are there some other reflections before I go into describing the sources of degrowth? Yeah. Okay. I wonder what are the links to the subsistence perspective of some economies like economies. Um, if the degrowth aims to, to be applied to the society that is that are not that, uh, that have that sufficient material problem. Yeah, we, we're very careful not to be, uh, let's say, eurocentric with the growth, because this has been kind of one criticism for the growth movement coming from the global south. Okay, the growth emerges as a kind of a concept that's very much applicable to Europe and probably the United States, not probably, certainly the United States and probably Australia and other countries, but it, it's not a concept that needs to be exported, and it's not a concept that needs to colonize the world. So, so this is why we talk about the importance of the pluriverse and the kind of different. And from a post-colonial perspective, it's important to think about the multiple sister movements that together make a pattern, and together we made a movement of multiple meaning, multiple significations, and multiple type of understanding, multiple approaches. So, the growth, the way we study here is the way we could apply. Uh, what could be applied at the level of the northern countries so that we could leave space to other humanities and non-humanities to, to actually live, right? And it's actually linking, um, bringing me to the first kind of source of the growth, the so-called critics of development. So, um, it's very much kind of, this is actually one of the primary origins of the growth. The fact that development has been a whole idea of progress of what what good life is is very much an invention of the West, which is which is having very colonial kind of, kind of spread. So the imaginary for a good life is based on high level of consumption in terms of, and consumerism is actually being exported to to, to the global south, and, and as a result of that, um, the the whole notion of plural world has been created. We're talking about infra mental infrastructure, perception of what is good and what is uh, progress, what is actually um, considered a life worth living, which is actually completely kind of pushed upon certain types of societies. So, develop, so the growth would be a step back and thinking, okay, let's drop the idea of what's progress and let's type of rethink the diversity of ways of living and let's try to value them. Let's not put one on top of the other, but let's see what type of balance we could find between the different uh, lives and, and different approaches to being. So here you have a bunch of quotes. So, so Latouf, for example, he says that um, develop, it is the development is a kind of ideological, quasi-religious quasi process of, of a kind of a mental invasion in which we are both victims, we perceive it, and we are agents because we keep on acting. And it's not very easy to drop this imagination of what's a good life, that is, that is important to have a car, a house, proper house, or this type of electrodomestic appliances to be able to go the shopping and that would have certain amount of clothes and etc. So this type of imagination of how the world is constructed 
it actually could be, could be questioned as well. Has been created, has been exported elsewhere. Um, so, so in the, that there, the group is kind of an idea to try to escape from this um, what Lapouche calls economization of our minds, or in terms of valuing mostly in terms of material possession or in terms of income. And, and calling that development. So development is not only an approach. And there is a lot of debate here. There's, there's those researchers and scientists who want to, to save the word development and say, okay, development could be quality improvement, and we want to keep this concept. And those and those who say, no, we we need to completely scrap the word of development, and and we need to scrap also the idea of developing countries because developing countries have a kind of a connotation of countries that need to catch up with the developed countries which are actually higher in the hierarchy. So the, the group is actually questioning this hierarchy and saying, hey, wait a minute, what is actually, we need to see whose values are, let's let go the level of the values and beliefs and livelihoods and who has the right to what and whose ideas can be put on, on whose ideas and, and let's kind of rethink this type of construction of hierarchical construction of whose um, livelihoods are superior. And of course, who's, and why do we need to value everything in terms of material accumulation? Or we just try to imagine a society where economic values are not central or global, but rather kind of the, let's say, the, the values of common aim, care, and mutual, mutual support actually put at the center, put back in the center as they have been now for centuries ago. And in this stream of the group, it was actually criticizing the, the market value, logic, and language. Criticizing doesn't mean um, completely scripting the idea of market. There's also kind of a division there. But it's kind of putting it as kind of a bit more marginal law, not putting markets in the center, not, value, not producing value for, in markets, but just like putting them in markets. Let's say market for local producers to steward, but not marketize everything and, and modify it. So that's the, the, the source of the growth that has to do with the critics of development. The other source of the growth has to do with like with the happiness study that I just mentioned before. And the idea that given that growth doesn't really increase our subjective well-being, probably the growth in which we have kind of equitable downscaling of consumption and revaluing our um, our way of living would probably um, not affect our well-being so we don't have happy lives if we don't have such inflated expectations of what um, of what our material conditions should be. And um, and there we have kind of for example the, the work of Kasser and Bruni and many others who talk about the importance of relational goods or the let's say goods in a kind of in a, in a kind of a different sense that relational goods are the goods that we create for, for our social interaction, for our sense of neighborhood, and our sense of community, in what we can create together. So actually, so the group is very much rooted in the idea of conviviality and, and, and the commons and creating the commons and recuperating the commons on, on the neighborhood level, on regional level, on municipality level, and um, etc. So that's the kind of the second stream of the growth. The first stream of the growth, it has to do with the kind of vacuum to limit the growth that I was like referring to earlier. So it's actually the growth here means bringing our macroeconomy to within the ecological carrying capacity of the planet. So this is what Herman, this is kind of a term borrowed from Herman Day. He, the carrying capacity of the planet is the capacity of the planet to absorb everything that we have, spit everything that we actually process. So you think of the planet as a kind of body, let's say the human body, everything that eats, passes through the human body and then gets extracted, right? And the planet is, is having the same. So you could calculate its carrying capacity in terms of how, how much carbon dioxide it could absorb, how much, you know, let's say, pollution in, in toxic ways it could generate, it, and, how, and what time it takes to process it and bring it back to non-polluted substances. So thinking of time that it takes to process it is all what we can do. So, so this is actually very similar to what I was talking in the beginning, so I'm just going to go with that. And here, so the fourth stream of degrowth is related to the idea of the 
robust autonomy and deeper forms of democracy. And this, and this dream of development is very much inspired by the Greek philosopher Castoriadis. Uh, have you heard about him? Okay. So he's actually because he, he's actually saying that capitalism growth and democracy are incompatible, and and, and that says the growth is envisioned a society of <laughs> made of multiple communities that constantly reflect upon their the norms and laws that are there constructed. Also, a society which constantly builds, evolves, and changes also their uh, laws and, and institutions. So it's not only about establishing the institutions together, but actually having the possibility to change when conditions change. And, and it's actually so it's kind of self-reflective society. Um, so, so the growth in that sense is a kind of perceived as a kind of deeper form of autonomy or of including freedom from wage labor or like labor which is also done for other means. Uh, here we have an, an, an interesting also stream of the growth has to do with a, a related to, the, to democracy. It's a critical reflection upon the role of technologies in our lives. And here we are inspired a lot by the work of Ivan Ilic. That's another name of a kind of uh, someone has heard of Ivan Ilyich? Yeah, I mean, he was kind of an author or a kind of researcher who found that equity and energy were growing together only up to a certain point, on a certain threshold, and afterwards, energy consumption grows at the cost of equity, which means that higher bureaucracies, higher level centralization always tend to be less equitable and less manageable. And and for example, he's, he's been kind of doing a lot of critical reflection on the role and the use of cars in society. And he is saying that beyond certain type of critical speed, no one can save time without making others lose time. Or in the sense is that cars are creating the type of remotedness that only they could actually shrink. I mean, like once you drive certain type of kilometers, you just like the, the car gives you the, gives you the freedom to drive further, and all, all the flight of the, the plane gives you the freedom to drive further, but at the same time, it creates the dependency to go there, and it actually creates the dependency to bring back, and it gives you something. So it's kind of sort of freedom plus, plus very strong dependency attached to it. So it's kind of the dependency to technology and the role of technology in complete constantly evolving technologies, almost autonomous body, is something that in growth stream is also very kind of critically reflected as well in relation to democracy. So in that sense, kind of just talking about the role of so-called convivial technology, technologies in which we could act upon and recycle and kind of do what we that. Okay, the growth of democracy, right? So the growth, another stream of the growth is like it actually inspired more from, let's say, Marxist literature is the growth of re politicization. So, it, so the growth in that sense kind of implies, um, so we, we could argue that capitalism is not, feas is not feasible without growth because, um, because let's say competition and, and accumulation are actually the central tenets of capitalism. Once you once you strip them out, then capitalism is kind of is kind of almost falling apart. And also, without growth, the so-called redistributive conflicts associated with 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 the lack of resources by those who exploit it are going to play, and then capitalism is like to fall, like to fall apart. And I have two more to go. The growth is environmental justice and the growth is social justice. So, and two other very important sources of the growth have to do with, with the call for environmental justice. So, and this is what we say, and this, is, this brings me back to the idea of the growth in the global north. So, the growth is a call to deflate the modern Western subject and leave the space, ontological and epistemological space of the of the other humanities to and non-humanities to actually exist. So this is what I was telling you earlier, recognition of the ecological depth which um, the North has actually been accumulating and accumulating to extraction of, of, of resources and actually bodies based in the South. 
and recognition and somehow response to these debts, which need not be only monetary, but also kind of bringing back access to land and bringing back the, the resources that they have. So actually recognition of the ecological debt and, and some sort of response or repaying of ecological debt, or also a call to bring all these environmental conflicts which are on the frontiers, uh, which are kind of hidden in countries which we call developing, and bring them back here where they could be democratically resolved in front of our eyes. Or, for example, the growth of environmental justice implies paying equal attention to those who are impacted by the mining conflicts worldwide as to the people who are consuming these goods. For example, if we want to take into consideration the lives of those living next to lithium mines or next to uranium mines, those replaced by windmills or etc., and have to compensate them for, for the loss or somehow avoid the mining, then, then the economy would not be able to grow and we would completely have to reshuffle the way we produce these goods. So yeah, the growth of environmental justice. Then the growth of social <coughs> justice is a call for redistribution of wealth. So so in this, so the, the principal argument there, which is very much advanced by Jason Hickel, is that there is enough for everyone. There is enough food, there is enough uh, material, there is enough. The planet is able to nourish everyone. But the question is how we distribute these material resources, right? There is enough for everyone without having to go. Just the question is how do we redistribute you know, in a kind of more fair manner what we have so far. And um, and the growth of social justice then kind of a very, another key notion that we've been taking up over the last years is the notion and practice of care as the center of our kind of economy that needs to be put at the center of our economy in terms of recognizing all the debt to all the reproductive workers that are, that are constantly doing regeneration of the conditions that we need for production. So the kind of all the bodies and all the individuals that are constantly producing put in the labor market behind these people and also the ones who are working, there is a huge amount of work and labor that needs to be taken into consideration and probably put at the central place because this is what actually nourishing the community, making the whole community exist. The whole the whole economy works through. So it's kind of this this needs to be kind of resolved in the design. Um, and beyond that, it's important to say that the growth is not meant to be kind of a dominating concept that should be exported all over the world. There is kind of a lot of system movements and kind of comparable uh, initiatives that are out there in the global south, which are called Buen Vivir. Perhaps some of you have heard about Buen Vivir in the south. Buen Vivir is kind of a bit there. It's kind of well, it could be interpreted in different ways. For example, the government of Ecuador is inter interpreted in that sense, but in general, the, the original sense of it is like when we live is kind of recognizing the implicit value of nature and the fact that the inseparability between nature and humans and the deep notion of well being and fulfilled life that's experienced through, through being in the interaction with the others and with nature. But there's also other, other type of movements like the Ubuntu in Africa. Um, the Batista project in Mexico, Ecosparai, which is kind of the, um, the self-sufficiency economy that very much started by Gandhi and Congress, inspired by when Congress in India. So there's a lot of, lot of movements that are kind of listed, just enormous, and there is a recent book that our colleagues from Mexico just started, just took out there, which is called The Pluriverse, which has more than one from entries from different types of imaginaries and, uh, and system movements in the global south. I have a lot of more slides, but I think probably the time to have a bit of discussion. <coughs> have a little bit of interaction. Hmm? Anyway, I said that I should finish at the one. Yeah, yeah I should finish now. So okay, let's 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 uh, let's have a bunch of questions and let's see what you think about all that. How would you relate all of this nonsense? We have been having lots, lots of, it's, so, there is lots of, lots of commonalities. For example, the growth is about 
like bringing back the means of production to workers and self-organized work. So kind of in terms of the means of production and, and, and kind of um, and also the exploitation of workers, the two movements are very much kind of T Crop is very much building upon the kind of Marxist critics. But the point is like classical Marxism is still very much productivist in the sense of kind of uh, very much growth oriented. Um, the, the new type of Marxisms, which are, let's say, we call them eco-socialists, like the eco-socialist movements are very much kind of aligned with, uh, aligned much more with the growth currently. Because like, let's say, their Marxists are very much on the eco-efficiency, green economy type of side, we need to stimulate the economy, produce more, etc. Okay, re, re, let's say, recap, re, recorporate, um, what was the word? Re okay, anyway, re re bring back the, the means of production to the, lay the workers, but still kind of in a more kind of growthist model. So there is a debate out there. Otherwise, the Marxist is a kind of system movement of degrowth, one of the bases and aspirations of degrowth. I don't know what that answers. Um, I just can't see uh, how can we have a sustainable relation with the planet if one of the most important parts of sustainability that is, well, that all the species have like a population control and we by medicine and by housing and all of this we have like destroyed this control. So is there, like, my question is there, if there's a margin for this in um, the growth economy. Could you repeat your question? I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. So you asked if there is a margin to, kind of, to space for, for all the other species. Yeah, the and for the groups. like exponential growth of people. Yeah. Right. Okay, like growth of people, well, growth of people is one thing in economic growth is another. But let's say, talking about human, human expansion, there is, there is the, you've heard probably the theory of peaks, peak oil. So there is like a lot of studies that show that soon we're going to be li li reaching a peak population and it's actually probably almost reached by the human population and global scale starts to be kind of decreasing already so kind of birth rates seem to be decreasing but I mean talking about globally right although in China and India so actually the, the expansion parameters of humans are not uh, are not in terms of population not so much but this is why the growth is exactly um, fleshing out the need to, re to reduce the space that we are taking, reduce the kind of our, let's say, urban sprawl, and, and actually rethink our needs and somehow have a bit more sober lives in order to leave space for the others so the others can simply live. So, this is exactly the point to kind of to drop the idea of exponential lives, to somehow rethink our material requirements and our ways of producing, and to some, for example, uh, if, if, you, if you live in London and if you're having with the, with the housing prices in London, it's actually constantly or elsewhere, also in Barcelona, often 50% of your income, I mean, if, you don't, if you're a young person, you don't earn so much, is paid. If you're forced to work, if you don't live with your parents, you're forced to work, you don't pay your rent. If there is social rent or if there is a distribution of housing, if there is equitable access to housing, we, you will not be forced to kind of to, to, to produce and not be forced to actually stimulate the economy so much. So actually consider the financial markets and the kind of the artificially well, artificially kind of um, boosted housing prices is forcing uh, many people to work more so that the economy could be boosted, so that they could pay back, uh, so they could pay kind of part of their income rent. But actually, if you don't have to pay rent, we'll be able to kind of earn much early, much less and you'll be able to actually live a life which is kind of based on less work. And this act, and, and that's and that's a huge discussion of many things inside. But for example when you talk about housing. Well in from a degree perspective we need to re rethink the way housing is built. Whether we need housing so, such amount of stock, such huge stack of vocational housing that's used just <coughs> one week per year. They're like think about all the vocational Vacation housing that they have on the, on the Spanish coast, or in the Pyrenees, or in, on the Alps, or everywhere. Like I'm from Bulgaria, I can see how the bubble, 
the, the, the kind of the bubble of housing stock completely expanded, completely covered months that were completely urgent earlier. So this type of model in which we kind of each type of wealth family needs a location housing is kind of could be resolved. Could we say okay we could probably share the existing housing stock better rather than just like everyone building their own buying their own house. So so this is another thing that housing in terms of kind of urban housing, there is not empty houses, so there is kind of Proposals that, that acknowledge the right to squatting is also kind of one of the proposals of GPRO. Like the right to occupy empty houses which are open or which have been abandoned for more than, more than like two years and that the use of the financial market for speculation are actually one of the proposals put forward for GPRO that actually needs to be kind of really considered very um, very serious. For example, I used to live in Amsterdam many years ago and there the right to squatting was actually legal right until 2009. And actually, Acknowledging the right of spotting in the 70s solved the huge housing problem of the Netherlands and it has been having a huge social impact over the years. So it's actually, I've, I've deviated myself, but it's actually a question has so many entries. So, for example, when you talk about expansion and space for other humanities, for other beings, for other kind of species, that can go wrong with this. Yeah. Anyway, any other ideas? Please. Yeah. <coughs> so you said that the growth is inherently compatible with the biological capitalism. Yeah. So uh, how could we define uh, an alternative system and alternative society and uh, which kind of values where uh, we base our decision making and how would we allocate resources? Yeah. For example, one proposal, and I can go into it because I can break this. Um, so. For example, one idea is like how we could one proposal that's out there that could be kind of rethought and implemented in different ways, just like for example to reduce the sectors of the economic activities that are most environmentally polluting and, and actually shrinking. For example, let's say marketing sectors, advertising, uh, to kind of let's say car production, especially luxury car production, Formula One type of sports. Um, the production of large sort of large housing like mud mansions, let's say the single use plastics, extraction of fossil fuels, and all the people employed there could actually for example, I would, as I was saying we have enough resources, we just need to have better distribution. So we have, one of the proposals that there is to reduce working time and distribute work better. For for example, like say if we have working time reduction, we're gonna have more job placement. So in that sense we have shorter working week, redistributing labor, and uh, a job guarantee. It's a kind of insured by the state, which could, or a basic income that could compensate those who have been kind of having to leave, those who have been disemployed by the unemployed by the sector that are closing down. That's one thing. So like living wage and basic income plus investment in public uh, services such as housing, health, and education. For example, if we don't have to pay for housing so much, for health and education, and, and transport so much, for other utilities, let's say, let's say energy, probably our income requirement would be much smaller. So that's kind of the hypothesis. You end, you would say, okay, where is this all income for, in, for the incorporation of basic income will come from, or for job guarantee? Well, the proposal is down there to have a kind of to have carbon pricing, for example, taxing carbon, taxing wealth, taxing land value, taxing resource extraction, and more than anything for geographics. Um, as an example of basic income, if you've heard about basic income experiments, right? That's kind of the basic income is like a right to a certain type of unconditional income that's given to everyone. Well, here in Barcelona, I've been just part of the team of Barcelona municipality under the government of kind of, well, let's see. Which the new municipality is going to be like that? The previous government, government installed a basic income in Besos and other kind of poor neighborhoods in Barcelona. And for about two years, they introduced the basic income tax, Renta Basita, for about 800 people. And what I was doing personally there was to see, to value the happiness of people before the introduction of, of this basic income, during the introduction of basic income, and after. The, pro the project is still kind of running. So the idea of this basic income was that the people who are facing themselves as unable to find work, to give them the possibility not to worry about income for about two years, and invest these two years in taking care of the families, but also in 
learning how they will start their own initiative, their own like small show, small social enterprise. So this program, the, the Renta Basica, includes included the still includes kind of not only the introduction of minimum income but also kind of programs for learning about social entrepreneurship, learning about social and solidarity economy, being involved kind of with um, at the community level in some more community initiatives, but also kind of the introduction of, a so, of um, alternative currency. With the idea is that after the basic income experiment is over, there's going to be social currency that's going to keep resources more or less circulating on local level. It's just one experiment that found there. A similar experiment is done in Finland, in Utrecht, there's this one is being done in Canada, so many, kind of you could see a little seeds of this type of proposal germinating here and there. That is saying that it's actually possible. It's actually coming with tax, it's been funding by food. It's the money for the basic income in Barcelona has been coming part from the European Commission, but partly from the redistribution that the, that the municipality of Barcelona has done by taking power, by taking the money that they were using before for other activities. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. um, what's the, like, from a degree perspective, what is, like, the opinion, like, who, what does the girl say about the existence of, like, huge metropolis in, like, big cities? Does that is believe that is sustainable? Or, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, um, so, the point is, like, it was time, some time ago we believed that the only, it was kind of generally assumed that the only logical way of being is to get out of the city, to have your house, and to kind of live there and become this life. But actually, if you take all the population, the human population, and you just like distribute it along the, along the whole earth, you're going to need almost in, in a way that everyone has a house and a piece of land. We don't have enough land. So actually, it seems that the, um, the urban sprawl or the kind of the bringing kind of people from the from the city to the countryside has been pretty ecologically damaging, actually. It is because so far, whenever, over the last 10 and 20 years, whenever ur urban people move to the countryside, they bring their urban lifestyle with the car, with all electrodomesticals, with high level consumption. So you could see that the, the, the typical pages de toda la vida, no, es como, es, 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 es having a completely different type of lifestyle from the, let's say, person working in an office, coming with, with all his family, being a huge house, with all type of facilities. So it's kind of, there's a clash, there has been a clash in terms of like what the perceived good life there. So actually, going back to the here, the, so this is why I like work on now, my research project is directed towards urban nature and how we could make cities more uh, more greener and more efficient because actually from a life cycle perspective and material throughput analysis it's more efficient to have all the resources brought to the city and somehow distributed and you, you need less transport when people are together you need less um kind of you could centralize education you could centralize healthcare so it's kind of resource wise it's kind of it makes more sense that we are kind of also in a city but of course we know we know that there's kind of huge contradictions with the, the level of waste that's being generated, with the level of air contamination that's out there, and of course with the amount of stress that's generated by the by all this machine of, of economic growth that are cities. So so the growth is actually thinking of uh, from the growth perspective, you could think of greener cities that are less dense, that are car free, or they just like have much more car free and slow slow areas than currently. But actually, the growth is not preaching to dismantle like, the metropolitan cities. No, we have cities as usual, but let's see how these cities can be rethought and let's say think of more urban gardens on top of the buildings, but think of somehow self sufficient buildings which have, let's say, solar panels and they have kind of more <coughs> energy. So th there's a lot of studies that, for example, Barcelona, that they're kind of calculating that if you take all the roofs, <coughs> fast if all the roofs <coughs> generate electricity, Barcelona could achieve quite big percentage of, of, of energy sufficiency, for example. So there is way to rethink certain cities and think of like energy and kind of in nature in cities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How we apply growth in an intersectional perspective? Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we have different priorities depending on our task. Um, but I can't stop thinking is what would happen with low-class communities which live in overpopulated cities. That 
having quite on reducing production. But then the contradictions appear, like we live in a globalized world in order to globalize and so on. So like pragmatically where can it start from? Yeah. Who 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 I mean like it's one of the this is actually here in India I had a bunch of questions and this is actually this is one of the the key um, oh, this is one of the key questions, who is the age of who's not starting growth? And it's, we, so it's not going to be one agent only, for example. We believe that, for example, certain, certain type of, it's more likely that the growth is more easy to implement at municipal scale. Let's say, for example, if we, I'm always referring to what we've been observing in Barcelona, for example, where the municipality could reduce to, do, to start a certain level of redistribution and introduce basic income while kind of posing certain type of more contaminating industries, let's say. On a state level, it's kind of, for example, we've been communicating a lot with Podemos. We've been trying to kind of say, okay, can you drop the growth? Uh, because in the Podemos agenda, there is like we feel kind of there's a lot of interesting kind of uh, cercanias, not closeness with, with the degrowth ideas, but still they seem to be the certain type of fraction for them, which is very much in favor of green growth. And so it's kind of at the same time, the European Greens now, we've been having a conference on, in the European Parliament with the European Greens, who fraction of the European Greens are starting to open up to the idea of degrowth. Others are saying, okay, now it's political suicide to talk about degrowth. Completely no one's gonna, all the kind of labor unions are gonna be kind of against. So I, I don't have a question, I don't have an answer. There's like degrowth in terms of reaching the state level. It, it's kind of, it's still, there's no blueprint. It's a kind of a process in the making for continuous debates. But where the growth is stronger, actually, in terms of actors, is at the very level of the community initiatives. It's something that we call now topias, or kind of the level of self-organized um, parallel realities, where we could actually experience different ways of being, different ways of acting, etc. Where in the social solidarity form, that is actually growing. So there is this theory, according to which we have kind of certain type of practices in the social solidarity economy which are growing in a niche and the idea is that this niche over time could expand and overtake the other sectors. But for this to happen still we need favorable laws, we need, need some sort of favorable environment. So that so the actors are everywhere. Actors could be at state level, the actors could be at municipal level, the actors could be at community level, the actors are in the university, the actors are you, all of you who are actually changing the way uh, economic teachings is being created and organized and inverting the roles. So you are all actors of degrowth for me. Tell me if I'm wrong. And um yeah. 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 So uh more or less on the same line from the last question. Mm. Um, and he said, um, if we are effectively running out of time, and we are kind of passing some breaking points, some even are already surpassed, um, and uh, the premise of the growth and how it's like, that's because it's over interesting, uh, but how can we join that with the, with the urgency that we're facing? It seems that um, just precisely in the time that we appear to need more straightforward, extreme um, solutions, extreme measures, <coughs> how can that be combined with this very slow, um, very democratic, and, and mm -hmm. very interesting decision making process and slow expansion into to different political arenas and, and parties and ideologies and stuff, uh, but with the need to act now and, and, and press for more direct action from that. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that's, exactly the, that's exactly the thing. Like the, the times of democracy are much slower than the times of decision making. And so what do we do with that? I mean, what you're saying has two aspects. One is like, indeed, we need to kind of act now. But when acting now, we need to be very careful not to reproduce certain type of repressive um, practices that have been used in the past. So in the sense like, yeah, we need to act with urgency, but acting with urgency could be 
um, repressive and then we impose hydro policies in a top-down way, uh, it's very likely that we're going to produce a, a reverse outcomes because we're going to receive a lot of pushback from those who, for example, if, if, if the Spanish government all of a sudden starts to kind of push for hydro without much democratic support, mm, it's likely that kind of the majority of the people are going to rebel against this and perpetrate that completely. On the other hand, I think the best way is to, is to act at the same <coughs> speed. So, for example, if you start with a kind of, if there is an opening, let's say, in political arena for, for different way, of, for different attitude towards growth, and stimulus of spaces where kind of we could have reflective debates on, on, the, on the state of the on state of humanity, the state of our, our planet, the conditions of our planet, at the same time, this upon how balanced out this is the political action, this is the way forward to go. But still, like, we have to be very careful not to go into war, let's say. Because at some point in France, a couple of years ago, there was a kind of a party which quite quite conservative, quite kind of a right-wing party which was subscribing to the degrowth argument, but kind of Almost uh, they copied everything from our uh, from our teachings, just uh, uh, just dropping the the right. Ah, yeah, because the growth is actually promoting the kind of the the gradual dismantling of borders and kind of the, the right to free movement. So actually, they dropped that and just like said, okay, we need to kind of our deep, have our beautiful deep growth France closing borders, etc. So it's actually so we need to be kind of. Considering those those both factors, so we have to be open to the pluriverse for the, for the for the various different forms of uh, existing, but while creating spaces for reflection. And actually, this makes me think of the importance of um, a reflection about what is freedom, right? The freedom is is the freedom to consume, a fr freedom to ride at 100 uh, kilometers per hour, freedom, because um, very often freedom could be actually Actually, the real freedom would be the one where you act knowing the consequences of what you're acting and deciding as a society to, 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 let's say, to restrain ourselves so that we could last longer as a planet, right? So actually, this is about our collective capacity to put, so the degrowth is actually a call to collectively put limits on ourselves, to decide these limits together. So that's really important to have at least certain type of degree of democracy. What type of degree of democracy is still in the making? It's still kind of in this process of self-discovery all the time, but still we need to kind of collectively decide on how we establish these limits and to what extent we want these limits. And this needs to kind of be supported with both top-down and, top and, and bottom-up processes. Yeah, top-down processes are faster, but also kind of very dangerous if you implement them all at once. I don't know, what's your answer? What do you think? No, I was going more for I mean, yeah, there's, there's a, there's a top-down version, but uh, what I was, I think I was kind of going for is that um, what we're basically talking about is dismantling capitalism, mm -hmm. the main dynamics that mm -hmm. growth is uh, facing mm -hmm. uh, are basically capitalist dynamics, mm -hmm. and uh, capitalism has resisted effectively all the other uh, times that they have tried to dismantle it. And so it will, it's actually reacting and, uh, very harshly towards the green growth, like for example, like the Green New Deal and other like, you know, Keynesian economics mixed with uh, renewable energy and stuff. So um, they will try to crack down this, however, they can keep their way of living hidden. That's against the well being of the majority, as it already is. So that. Um, I don't know, I was trying to think how we can overcome the resistance. Uh, probably that way, probably with more democracy, probably with, um, with getting people interested, with giving people power, uh, in that way that uh, you can entice them to, to keep on participating. Uh, yeah. What's happening now with the uh, rebellion extinction is just now, like, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a movement that not only for me, it's a movement that it's not only kind of uh, ecologically oriented, you kind of can say, okay, our, our lives are in your hands and oriented towards the governance, but it's also kind of movement that finally acknowledges the role of emotion and intuition. Because 
you could see, I mean, I was looking at the, at the speech of Greta the other day, and I was thinking, what she's saying could be said by, let's say, let's say, president, or like, let's say, parliamentarian or some sort of business consultant. But the place from which she's speaking, the emotion and um, commitment and the kind of truth for which she's speaking is actually having this power of, and having, is having this influence. So it's kind of acting not only from the mind, but also acting from the heart, from the emotion. It's actually an, uh, acting from just another place is what's actually driving change as well. So just like but then you crash that on the logic of, of uh, modernity uh, says that we have to think rationally and we must like think our steps and I mean I agree with you that that means changing the actual imaginary of how we make decisions and how our world we are. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I agree. <laughs> 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 it does, it does, yeah. I think out of rationality is still being kind of pretty problematic, and this is actually one of the critics of modernity. That actually we need to kind of acknowledge emotions as a kind of equally valid basis to act. Not as only basis to act, but we need to kind of listen to emotions as a kind of source of intelligence as well, because emotion and vision also kind of gives a lot of intelligence to act. But the question again is where does this crash start? I mean, when, when or where or with whom? Um, we figure out in every one of us. I was first looking at the personal level. But, um, I mean, for instance, that, that um, is a catalytic kind of study, non cambiar. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps it's cambiar. It's kind of the fact that these, two, that these circles actually are actually taking place means that, and the fact that you're receiving credits for them, and the fact that you could do your kind of final, or you could do some work with this, with this theory, it means that you've done minimal change. For me, it, it, it's, it's a change, it's slow, it's super slow. But yeah. And actually, for example, thanks to that, NICTA, we're having kind of a whole department on the growth economics, and there we could meet activists, researchers. So it's actually, there is some spaces in academia where it could still be activists and researchers and kind of go for the ideas that we believe are worth pursuing. <laughs> So carry on, please. This is very important. I'm just looking at you and it's like, yeah, please carry on with the circles. It's kind of it's really important. It's kind of really lots of great technology that will make this happen. Mm. <laughs> I recordar que totes aquelles persones que voleu el Credit Parks, a part de la de les xerres que tenia la signatura de Fui, hauríeu de fer un assaig exposant, bueno, us m'ho explica totalment, que us vau enviar ahir, si no m'equivoco, per fer creieu que els mateixos no estaria protegits amb els estudis de la facultat d'economia, i necessitat us ha parlat més, o desenvolupar algunes de les teories que hem vist, i si alguna persona que no vol dir que ens vol fer arribar a l'assaig, també estarem encantats i en canvi més bé. I per acabar, em deixaré dos minuts a la companya d'AEM perquè us digui una cosa. Som una nova associació, es diu AEM, que és ecologista a la Pompeu i som unes quantes estudiants que volem canviar certes coses de la universitat. Doncs us demanem la vostra col·laboració perquè ara mateix l'acció que tenim... Bé, no sé, la vols explicar tu. Sí, bé, ara mateix estem treballant en una acció que hem portat diversos sacs i servidors per la facultat a la qual ens agradaria molt si poguéssiu depositar, si utilitzeu, que espero que no, ampolles de plàstic, perquè estem fent una recollida per després fer... Sí, doncs dilluns volem fer una escultura amb aquests plàstics per demostrar a la gent de la universitat que consumeix aquestes ampolles de plàstic a la cafeteria realment la magnitud del problema, ja que hem intentat eliminar-ho des de la pròpia cafeteria, però no ens hem deixat, per tant volem que el canvi comenci des de vosaltres, des dels estudiants, i doncs volem que si dilluns, per exemple, tenim una estona lliure, doncs ens ajudeu a com ens van semblar les cultures perquè estem encantats de rebre la vostra ajuda. Doncs si us voleu seguir a Instagram és AEM i amb quins ja ja ho veiem tot i tant. Thank <laughs> you.